today's webinar, as we discussed last week, is going to be on energy metering in Loxone, how we do it, why we do it, and there are a couple of points that we really want to stress over. And we're going to go from why, what, and how to really execute it with a mini server, with a config, and everything else we have in between. So without further ado, let's get ourselves started. So first of all, the reason why. The obvious reason is the energy crisis is happening now. It's not happening tomorrow. It's not happening in two years time. It's not happening in the near future. It's happening right now and we need to be prepared for it and we need to make the best out of a bad situation. So if we can provide some features to our customers that will make them save energy, save time, and also um, provide more functionalities, more comfort for them, that is exactly what we want to do. Now, as you know, energy prices have been shooting through the roof. Gas prices have been shooting through the roof. Most UK houses are not that well insulated. So we're wasting a lot of energy. People are staying cold in the houses just because they're so afraid to switch on the heating just in case that might cause them 300, 400 pounds extra. I've had quite a few people in here um, come in here and say, oh, I'm actually paying 2,000 pounds a month for my electricity bills. And it's stuff like that that's really scaring the uh, customer and they want to find alternatives, but they want to have some system to take care of that aspect and it does it for them rather than them having the input every single time. So this is exactly what we're going to discuss and exactly the reason why we're really, really focusing on it. Also, we're obviously an automation solution. It does not need to be residential. It can be a commercial space. For example, this office is an absolutely amazing example when it comes to energy savings because with without doing like pvs without doing battery storage without doing all the um consumers uh, all the uh, without monitoring all the energy that's coming in or going out we managed to do 25 percent savings so 25 percent savings over the period of about four months is what paid uh, back the whole system that was initially installed so it had just a mini server a couple of ip commands being sent to an ac unit out, out outside of the building and we had two compressors so basically a core automation unit a mini server and a couple of temperature sensors was everything that we needed to be able to set up the system optimize with the intelligent room controllers with the climate controllers make sure that it's always at the right temperature at the right time and what did we receive in return this space is now way better as you can see i'm just wearing a t-shirt it's 22 22 and a half degrees all the time our energy bill went down about 750 quid. And then over the past four months that the system has been running, it cost about 2000 pounds worth of like retail costs to install. So we actually managed to make a return on investment. And now we're only make, making money or we're losing less money because we have locks and control in our heating solution. Now, the very first step of how to do it and how to achieve it is going to be the devices that we need to install in our own project to be able to say, okay, I want to be able to meter. I want to know where my energy is going. So the very first thing is going to be metering. And that is why we're focusing on this for today's webinar. Now, what would you use to uh, just have a, a reading from the installation? So if it's a single device, maybe you're going to just plug a smart socket. And as you know, our smart socket is going to give you the current energy that's being drawn. So how many watts or how many kilowatts the device is drawing. It's going to give you information over the period of time. Also, you can have a CT clamp meter. So maybe just a CT clamp meter, a pulse meter that is connected to a digital input of the mini server that is just going to send pulses. And maybe every 10 pulses mean that one kilowatt has gone through. So that way we can read a circuit or a device. And once we know where all the energy is going, then we can do our best to minimize the usage or we can use that energy at best time of day. So, for example, we're going to be looking at something a little bit later today that is going to show us what if uh, I have variable tariffs throughout the whole day? Can I use the most amount of energy, let's say 10, 15 kilowatts, whatever it is, whenever the tariff is the cheapest? So for example, Octopus, they're going to provide us uh, the energy tariff for every half an hour. And I can just pull that information in. I can say, okay, this is the cheapest point or this is the best average for the day. Let me use maybe the dishwasher. Let me use the washing machine. Let me switch a couple of things on. Or even better than that, let's say that you have a PV system. Your PV system is obviously producing energy. 
and you want to make sure that you can save that energy for later. So whenever you're producing during the day, it's sunny outside, the weather's nice, you're producing, let's say, 10 kilowatts. Why not switch on a car charger? Why not switch on the heating system? Because this room, for example, the air itself or the floor, let's say you have underfloor heating, that is going to act as a big, big battery. So it's going to heat up the room. It's going to keep that heat for a very long period of time. And it's going to make sure, okay, you're not just wasting that energy. So for example, in this office, if we go out and we're not in here Saturday, Sunday, we can heat up the office to, let's say, 16, 17, 18 degrees, whatever we have the spare energy to do. So next time we have to heat up for Monday morning, we actually don't need to go from um, 5 degrees up to 22. We maybe only have to go from 10 or 12. So it's just that energy storage that we have for the whole space. So it's not necessary for you to have a battery, but maybe some kind of heating source is going to be beneficial overall. Now, a couple of devices that I can show you to give you a better idea. If you go to the locks and library, as you know, uh, to put something on the main supply or to the grid and watch how much you have, how much consumption you have to the house, maybe how much production or how much you're sending back to the grid. The easiest thing to do is use an energy monitor or energy meter. Most common ones on the markets do support Modbus. And Modbus is probably one of the most common protocols, very easy to use, and we already support quite a few devices in here. So if you go to the library, go to energy, you can see quite a lot of meters of Fronius, OBs, um, and it, pretty much anything that you can think of, Carlos, Italian brands, German brands, everything is already in. However, if there's a specific one that you want to integrate, of course, speak with either me or one of my colleagues, and we can just look into, let's say, you have the Modbus addresses. We can just configure it on our site and make sure that's up and running. Once we have this ready, we can integrate, we can point that into our mini server, and we can say, okay, um, we're now reading that information. What are we supposed to do with it? And this is where I'm jumping into my next point, the actual NG meeting and how we're going to do it. So if we do a live demo, I'm going to show you all the new blocks, all the features that they have, and how cool it actually looks in the app whenever everything is being used properly. So I'm going to do a couple of scenarios. We're going to look at the pulse meter. We're going to look at, let's say, for example, a smart socket that is currently drawing power. We are going to look into an energy meter or a CT clamp and anything else that can feed us back some information to know, okay, how much energy we're using or producing. Also, if you have a battery, how much energy are we storing into the system? So if we jump into config, I already have it open actually on my site. There it is. I'll start a new project. Are we connected to 53A4 is the mini server we're looking for. But not see it. Oh, 53A4, there it is. There's my mini server. Let's start a new project before that. Yes, it's going to be a mini server. The project is going to be energy metering, obviously, for today. So let's give it a name. So we come here. I'm going to call it energy metering. Always tend to change the name to the mini server of mini server let's search and connect with the correct device so my mini server is 53 a4 so if you find it in here it's currently formatted let's connect and we'll set it up cool the room that we're going to work on today we're just going to call plant room or we can call central Anything you want, it doesn't really matter as long as it makes sense to you. So I'm going to call it plant room. I'm going to give it a room of plant room as well. Then we want to create it. Yep. Maybe give it like a little gain up or something that makes sense. 
you go. And it's a room type of Ada or central. Let's put central for now. Oh. Favorites, definitely say OK. We save in. Let's change the password of the mini server as well. So it doesn't come up with a pop-up window. Of course, as you guys already know, it's going to be the most secure password in the universe. It's going to be admin admin, of course. And there we go. Saving the mini server. Say yes, and we should be able to get started. Next in, there we go. Awesome. So I'm not going to learn all the device at the moment, but I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas. So the very, very first thing that we have, or the very first meters that we want to show you, if you go to app function blocks, we're looking for meters and now this is what we're going to be focusing today every single meter where it exists how to use it i want to start with the easiest one to understand and the one that actually makes a lot of sense uh, when it comes to uh, what was made what it came to life and how easy it is to use so the first meter is going to be the fixed value meter what does that mean there's always going to be the, a one or two three five devices in the house that as soon as you switch them on they're going to consume X amount of energy. That's going to be just a constant. So maybe you switch on a kettle. That kettle uses 500 watts immediately as soon as it's switched on. Or you have something like, I don't know, an immersion heater. Your immersion heater can only do one value and one value only. So maybe it's doing 2.3 kilowatts or there's an electric panel in the room. Anything like that we can have on a fixed meter. As long as we can read the information, whether or not the relay is on or off, we can have the fixed meter in and we can have multiple devices in the house. So for example, if I know for a fact that I have a monitor, I have a TV, I have something in the house that is always using 500 watts, three kilowatts, I can add as many devices as I want at pretty much no cost. So as long as I can have a digital input in, in config, letting me know that this device is on, that's everything I need. So let's add a fixed value meter. Let's have a quick look at it. So my case, I'm going to actually be doing an immersion heater. So let's give it a name. And my immersion heater is going to be fixed. It's not going to be variable load. It's not going to be zero to 500. It's just going to be fixed. As soon as it's switched on, it's going to be consuming two kilowatts. So the first thing that I need to change is the power uh, rating of normal flow. So basically, how many kilowatts are we consuming as soon as it's on? In my case, it's two kilowatts. And you can see in here, in the unit of power flow, it's set to kilowatts. So if I send 0.5, it's obviously going to be 500 watts and so on, and I can trickle down as much as I want to. So let's say two. And then if you want to do any offsets, so maybe it's not as accurate when it comes to the device, you can do the offsets in here, but you don't really need to. The unit for energy or volume is going to be kilowatt hours, makes sense. However, all of these meters can be used for something else as well. So let's say that you are currently monitoring hot water. Let's imagine a block of flats. And in that block of flats, you have seven apartments, but you have a central plant room. And in that plant room, we have everything. So all the heating, all the cooling, everything that's going to every single flat. And you want to monitor how much is going to each flat, how much hot water are they consuming, how much gas are they consuming at the moment. You can have a water meter, you can have a pulse meter, you can have a gas meter, so you can measure every single thing that goes through. So it does not need to be kilowatt hours, it can be liters, it can be uh, cubic meters, it can be everything in between. As long as you have some information that you're feeding in, we can just put the value in here. So let's show you how it actually works. So let's say that we do have an immersion heater that we're switching on and off. I do have a recommended block, so obviously, immersion heater, you don't want to have it running 24-7. You want to run it for maybe an hour and a half until it is switched off. 
So a block that we tend to use in here is called the stairwell light switch. So if you grab the stairwell light switch, that's everything we need. Again, if you don't know how to go to a block, you can press F5 and you can type the name in. It's context sensitive. So if you type in anything related, it's going to pop up. I'm going to again call this immersion heater. So that's going to be available in the app. So as a backup, if a client ever needs to, they're going to go in here and going to switch it. Obviously, we need the relay to be able to switch it on and off. So if we go to the relay itself, let's just grab a digital output, connect it in. I'll change the name to immersion here as well. And now all the information that we really need to the fixed value meter is very simple and very straightforward. You just need to tell it that immersion heater is on or off. Nothing else, nothing more complicated. So if we drag this, a reference from here, connect it to S. As you can see, S means state. If it's on, it's one. If it's off, it's zero. Let's save this into the mini server and see what we did. That goes through. I'm going to go to the Loxon app as not every single new feature is implemented in the other one. But if I go and search my mini server, what was it again? A4, 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 A4. I can't see it. What is it? What's the IP? Let's go back to config. Let's quickly find out. 10.7.4.2.1.0.2. Makes sense. 10.7.4.2.1.0.2. Admin demo case, as you all know. Let's go to my rooms. We have a plant room in here already. And here it is. So immersion heater, what is the situation? The boiler has stopped functioning the way you expect it to, and you have immersion heater as a backup. The client wants to go, press a button, and then the immersion heater is going to start cutting down. Obviously, we can adjust the timer. So you can adjust it and say, OK, I want to have it for half an hour. I want to have it for an hour. It doesn't really matter in this case. But what you can see is that automatically, it does some calculations in the background. So if it's using two kilowatts an hour, you can see for every single second, every single minute that's gone through, it adds 14 watts, 15 watts, and it's going to keep adding. So basically going to break down that hour. So the idea behind it is if you can get a way to get that value from logic, why put a CD clamp here? Why spend extra money on hardware when there's already a way for us to break it down and say, okay, it's running. So we're currently consuming X amount of energy. So that is a very, very nice and smart way to do it. As you can see, you can also go to the meter itself and you can see what's going on. So for example, in our case, currently it is consuming, it, it has consumed 30 watts so far, 36 watts, and that keeps updating. Obviously, as long as the device is on, then if we had this running for days, weeks, or and months, you can also break down that information. So you have the live data, and you also have the data over time. So very, very useful, all that data is being saved in. I think it's every half an hour at the moment by default, but of course you can look more statistics if you want to. So minimize this, go back to our config, and let's look at a different example. So what else is very easy and very, very common? A lot of systems or a lot of actuators, they have a pulse meters, which means that let me actually show you. It's going to be better. It's more visual. So if we say 24 volts, pulse, meter, water. There we go. Ah, of course. What else? Um, let's go to something like this. No, not the greatest example. OK, maybe something like this. So a device like that, what it can do for you, 
every 10 liters or every 100 liters, whatever the, the set point is, it can send a pulse and it can let you know, okay, one liter of water has went through. It's exactly the same when it comes to gas meters. You can have a very similar looking device, but instead of every liter of water, it's going to let you know every, let's say 10 cubic meters of gas that went through, it's just going to provide a pulse. What we can do is we can connect this to a simple digital input on the mini server. So there's no hardware cost, uh, no extra hardware cost on locks on site. And then we can read that pulse every single time it's being sent. So let's do that example and set up in config. So in my case, I'm going to add a function block. We're going to again go to meters and we're looking for a pulse meter. There it is. Drag it on and drop it on the page. And now again, fairly, fairly straightforward. We need digital input. So let's grab one. We are going to say that this is ground floor lights or something, or let's say outdoor lights because it makes a bit more sense. So obviously your outdoor lights are not going to be locked on. They're not going to be 24 volt. There's not going to be anything fancy, any color changes, or at least in most projects, they're not going to be. In our case, our outdoor lights are going to be on, off, but, and you want to get a pulse every single time they change state. But I take this back. That is probably going to be better for a fixed meter because you're probably going to know, okay, this light is using 50 watts, this light is using 100 watts. So let's wait for this one for a second and we're going to create a di different one. We're going to use a pulse meter on, hmm, let's say car charger and you just have a CT clamp on that car charger. And that's the way that we're reading information through. So I'll just grab this. Oh, let's also give it more descriptive. So car charger, pulse meter, CT. I know it's too much information. You can also put that in the description. For example, you can just put pulse meter in here and you can put the pulse meter CD in the description. So this is just visible for yourself. You can also add hint text and just say, this is connected to the left car charger. Anything that makes you kind of remember which device is connected to, you can have in. So this is a car charger. Then simply on the pulse meter block, there is a pulse. So that's where we want to connect it to. Drag it and drop it in. Then we go to the pulse meter and let's see. Now you can see number of pulses per unit. And in here we can see the unit that's currently being shown. So in this example, the unit is kilowatts and kilowatt hours on the bottom. So maybe we don't want to send a thousand pulses because in this uh, situation, I'm going to be just simulating it. So I don't want to send a thousand pulses, but maybe let's say I'm going to set 50 pulses or I'm going to send 30 pulses or yeah, let's say 30 pulses. And every uh, 30 pulses mean that there's going to be a one kilowatt going through that pulse meter. Or even easier for you to simulate if you have just two wires at home, let's say 10. So every 10 pulses that the device sends or the pulse meter sends, it's going to be equal to a kilowatt. So if we send 60 pulses a second, it's obviously sending six kilowatts down to the device or down to the car charger. Let's save this one in and let's have a quick look in config. Sorry, in the app. So go back to our plant room in this case. Pulse meter, we forgot to change it. Our pulse meter is going to be the car charger. Save in and then go back. There we go. Car charger. And now I'm going to use just a digital input on my side. And let me just change cameras to this. So basically I have a digital input in here that I can press. And every single time I press, we're supposed to be able to update information for the car charger. I used input two actually in my case. So if I go with input two, 
you can see if I send 10 pulses, it's going to detect its X amount of kilowatts. Actually, we're going to megawatts in here, but let's go 62 kilowatts. I'm sending quite a few pulses, but you get an idea. If I send a pulse quite infrequently, then it's going to take the frequency into account and it's going to start adjusting itself. So you can say, okay, at the moment we're sending far too many. However, again, quite easy to offset. If I come back in here and tell it instead of 10 pulses per unit, do 100 pulses per unit, then I really need to pause that input to be able to change the information that's being sent to or kind of reduce the values. If you go back to the plant room and I press a few times, as you can see, that's way more reasonable. We're still sending 200 kilowatts for the car, but as you know, there are quite a few new cars I can take way more than that. As soon as we reduce the frequency of pulses, that goes up. So, change cameras back in. So, as you can see, it's pretty, pretty module. If you have the right amount of pulses, usually on the device is going to say how many pulses equal what. So, for example, you might have the following situation. A thousand pulses equals one liter of water or equals 100 liters of water. You can have a pulse meter again. So let's grab another one. Let's call it hot water. Let's grab another input. Uh, this is going to be water flow pool sensor. And now in here, the only thing that we really need to change is we change this. So I'll just call it V1. Let's say in my case, every 10 pulses are going to be 10 liters of water to keep it simple. So liters, and then we we'll put liters per hour. This is V.1, sorry, there you go. And then every 10 pulses we said is going to be that much. So we save in. We go back to the app. Hot water. I pulse it. Is it number three? Yeah. There we go. So every 10 pulses, there's my leader. If you keep pulsing, it's going to just keep opening that information. So you can record different things. Obviously in here, the icon doesn't make too much sense, but you can change all of that. So you can come back in here and say, okay, I don't want it to look this way. I want it to look like a water drip or water droplet. Maybe something like that's going to be more reasonable. So this way the customer is not going to be confused or you're not going to be confused when you go to the app and say, okay, why does this look exactly the same way? There we go. There's a water droplet. And then the water droplet changes in here as well. So it's going to look nice and fancy. Awesome. But then we can do so much more than just that. Now we have pulse meter, we have fixed volume meter. Let's go to the real one, the one that actually makes sense. Now, if you have, for example, a smart socket on a device, I can see how much my laptop is currently drawing at the moment. Or if I have a proper CT clamp in, that is not just a pulse meter, but it's um, feeding me back exa the exact information of how many kilowatts we're reading. So maybe a zero to 10 input, that is going to be much, much better. Or if I have an inline uh, energy meter, that can let me know how much is going to the grid, how much is going from the house. So let's actually simulate that. In my instance, I'm just going to use analog inputs to be able to just rotate them around and be able to send different values. But in your case, it can be different. So for the house, let's have a meter. Or well, actually, the house can go both ways. So you can get energy from the grid, or you can consume energy, or you can just send energy back. So if you have a PV and you're producing way too much, you can be sending energy back to the grid. So we can sending energy back to the grid. So we need a bi-directional meter 
and that's why this one exists. So let's go down to it. There it is, meter, bidirectional. Click it, drop it on the page. And now, as you can see, obviously this one is slightly more complex. So it has power flow, where you connect your, the, your current power flow. You have the meter consumption, meter delivery, and all of that information, I'm just going to simulate with three zero to 10 volts inputs or the rotary knobs that I have on my demo case. So if we grab all three of them, one, two, uh, no, not here, go here, two, three, I'm going to change the names. So they're going to match and it's going to be easier for you guys to see. flow then we have the media reading consumption then the very last one is delivery there we go and i also want to map them because as you know currently my 0 to 10 volt sensors are just saying 0 to 10 but we can obviously do more we want to do more, so let's do that. If we go to, let's say, power flow, currently the sensor's input values are between zero and then the target is, sorry, so it's mapped between zero to 10. So if it gets a zero to 10 input from the block or from, from the sensor, it's going to map it to something. In my case, let's say the power flow, I want to map to maybe peak, let's say, I don't know, five kilowatts. So it's going to map my rotary switches or maybe, let's say we can do a little bit more than that. We can do 30 kilowatts. Then we go to the next one. We do exactly the same. Let's say that we have a very, very nice uh, PV system that can go in, save it in and let's see what's happening. Okay, there we go. So let's go to the app. And we can see one of the nicest things, or one of the nicest additions in config. So meter, bidirectional. I should have renamed this one. I should have called it grid, but we're going to do that in a second. So if I go to the other camera, I don't think you will be able to see as much, but basically I've mapped these three analog inputs, 0 to 10 volts, to simulate consumption, how much power we're currently drawing from the grid. So you can see if I map it up, I'm currently consuming 10 kilowatts. If I note it down and it go with the very last one, we also can see the delivery. So we're selling 10 kilowatts back to the grid. So power flow, so how much power is actually going through, currently about eight kilowatts. And you can just adjust these knobs to do different things for you. Now, all of that data on its own is still very, very useful because as you know, there are quite a lot of projects, especially in the UK, where they have that smart meter that's already in the house. It's kind of doing the same, but not to, it doesn't have as much information. It's basically just giving you live data and saying, okay, currently you're using X amount of kilowatts times 26P times 40P, whatever your rate is. It's going to cost you this much money. So you've made or you've saved 20 pounds a week, depending on which uh, smart meter you have. Now let's go in here and show you the one thing that really makes a change. Now the bidirectional meter, we're going to rename to grid. Or you can just rename to house, but obviously we're looking at the grid. Then we need one more thing that can go in a system. If you really, really think about it, it's kind of obvious what we don't have. So we have a few consumers, we have the car charger, we have the um, immersion heater. We might add a few more just to be able how, to show you how you play around with them. But there's one more thing that we want and that thing is the PV. 
So in a high-end project, or nowadays actually not that uh, uncommon to see in a very new, uh, in a brand new installation for people to be putting PVs in, because obviously they want to be more self-sufficient. They want to be able to go away from the grid. So we're going to use a PV and we're also going to have a battery storage. So in a case of a power cut, or if let's say you have a very nice battery and you are generating a lot of energy throughout the day because your PV is producing a lot, we can store that energy for later and use it whenever we obviously don't have any sun out. So that is one of the best uses for a PV system. Just make energy, save it, use it whenever you're not making anything. So if you want to be as self-sufficient as possible, you obviously need a big PV system and you need a nice battery to go along with it. So what we need is again, a meter. I think you can probably already guess by having a look at all of them, but there's a post meter in storage, there's a meter, meter in storage, and there are quite a few more. I'm just going to use the meter in storage because I think it's the easiest one to use in my example, because I have one more switch left and it's available to me. So if I grab the meter in storage and I'm just going to call this PV and battery. So whenever the client goes to the app, they don't just confuse saying, okay, what is this? What is it supposed to do? They can directly see it. Now, for this, there, there are quite a few things that we can connect to this one. As you can see, the power of flow, the meter reading consumption, meter reading delivery, and all that information is already in. It's exactly the same as a normal meter, but we don't need all that information. And our case is going to be the delivery. So how much energy we're producing and the power of, of the flow itself. Power of flow, we can say that it's exactly the same as this one. So I don't have to create another one, first of all. But then let's go and mess with the consumption values or the delivery. So how much energy you're feeding back. We're just going to call this PV production. And then we're also going to tell, sorry, this is a battery, but doesn't matter. I'll show you that in a second. And state of charge or level of charge. You can adjust this one as, again as much as you want to, but in my case, I can't be asked to change every single value. I just want to show you, okay, the battery in our case, in our scenario is going to be 70% charged. It's going to stay 70% charged. So I'm just going to use a constant. I'm going to set that constant to 70% and just going to call it state of charge for the battery. So I'm just going to put this value on 70%. So as soon as it's on, that's how much is going to send to the block. Let's save in the mini server and see what we can do with that information. Where would you put the corresponding PF? Yeah, this is somewhere we can use it. Obviously, if you're already reading, so, sorry guys, the question was the following, where can you use the corresponding PF output? Because there's also a PF input and an output. So for example, if you're already reading that information from the grid, you don't need to have another CD clamp, another meter that is going directly to your PV system to read the production. You obviously know how much energy the house is consuming. Uh, if you start exporting, you can say, okay, instead of exporting, ship that energy somewhere else. So I can actually grab the information from the back of the block. The block itself is going to do its own calculations, going to say, okay, this is how much we're producing, this is how much we're using. So I can essentially disconnect this and say power flow directly from the other block, save in the mini server, and that's going to go through as well. I know quite a few people just have one meter and then kind of manipulate the data, say plus, minus, this and that to be able to achieve what we're currently doing. But in our case, Let's have a look in the app and see what's going on. So we have PV production, e reading delivery, all the sensors, everything connected. Can you have multiple PF outputs to the one input of PF? No, we can only have one because then it's gonna get confused with which data we're sending. So if you go to our battery, and here we can see uh, battery storage level. Obviously I set a constant to 70%. So it's currently saying just 70%. That is the state of charge. If I twist the knob, 
in here. You can see the battery itself charging. And obviously, if it's discharging, I can just adjust the power flow from the other block. So it's going to just send that information through. So we're using the information from the other block because the house is currently using it and is discharging at six watts an hour or whatever that state might be. Now, one thing that I didn't consider, I didn't want to call this PV and battery. I wanted to call it PV's battery, but let's just put as battery for the moment. And we're also going to add the PV in just because it's better to have that separation. Now we have the battery, we have the grid, we have a few consumers. Let's actually go to the PV itself and kind of isolate it from the rest. So if we go with, uh, sorry, meter, and I'll just use the generic one in our case. We don't need anything else. It's not bi-directional. The power is going from the um, panels directly to the house. We're not selling it. We're not uh, pushing it back to anything. So just grab a meter. We're going to call this one PV. And then to this one, in my case, I don't really want to change a lot when it comes to the battery. I'm just going to grab this. Or we can also create a virtual input if you want to simulate it this way. Maybe let's grab a virtual input because it's also nice to show if you want to simulate it this way. So I'm going to call this um, energy production. Drag it, drop it here. And then we don't want the mirror reading. Uh, actually, that's fine. The power flow, again, I can have exactly the same one. Just this block, power flow can stay the same throughout. Now, you have the meter readings. So this is how much we're going to be sending. I'm just going to map that sensor. Let's say minimum value is obviously zero, but then maximum value is probably going to be, let's say 30 kilowatt system is what I have. And then default values and all of that we don't need. So if I save this in, I can also go back to the app and adjust the PV. Now, depending on what your use case is, if you just want to see some data on the screen, I'll say just use constants or uh, use a manual override from the system. Or alternatively, you can do simulation and you can just give it a couple of values in here and see what the blocks output. Unfortunately, with simulation, you won't be able to see it in the app, which is kind of important in our case. So if I go in the app, go back to my plant room, and there it is, energy production. I'm going to say I'm going to be very bosey. We're producing 15 kilowatts. So we should be able to go to the PV. There we go. So today, so far, 15 kilowatts. If I increase the power flow a little bit, these values are going to start going up. So 15 kilowatts power flow set to kind of low level. We can read that information in, and we're currently producing 12 kilowatts at a second. I can raise it up from my side, tone it down, anything else I need. Now, this is nice, but as you can see, the page itself or my app is getting super messy. This is not something that is going to be uh, friendly to the end user. So we want to have something that groups them all together and shows us where the energy is being produced, how, where's the energy you're currently going to? Um, is it bi-directional? Is it going to one direction? Is the house consuming it? What exactly? What is exactly happening in our case? That's where the energy flow monitor comes into play. And the energy flow monitor is going to group everything nicely and it's going to give us a cool visualization in the app to make it, um, it was very crisp and for the customer, easy to read, easy to see, and most importantly, easy to use. So if we go, F5, or if you go actually to energy, you can find it either way. There it is at the very top, energy flow monitor. That is the correct one we need. You press it, drop it, and this comes with its own box as soon as it's connected. And now, obviously, there are a few things that we can do in here. The first one is you want to add meters. 
And as soon as I click it, this text box comes up and asks me, hey, what do you want to add? And what do you want to add it under? So let's select all. And I've, actually, I'm not going to add the hot water because we just care about energy at the moment. But I'm going to add the immersion heater, the PV, and all of that apply. And now it's going to be added in here. Now, icons and all of that is not as important. The important information that you really need to set is, is this a consumer? Is this the grid? Is this a PV system? Why exactly this? As soon as you put one of the blocks that have storage options in, it's going to count as a battery. So this one we don't need to adjust. But for example, our PV, our PV is going to be a producer. Oh, I realize you can't see it on your side. Let me see if I can fix this. Grab this. Screen share the screen. There you go. Wait, we're going back. This config didn't like me changing screens. So if I double click on it, this comes up. Now back to it. PV is obviously producer. So we can just select it from here from the drop down. Grid is going to be our grid. We have a car charger, consumer, of course. And then we have an immersion heater, which is consumer as well. So all of that is fine for me. The unit of power and all of this, you don't need to change at the moment. We've already changed them in the block and just going to take the information that was already put in the block. Category, is it energy? What else it is? Is it climate control? Is it water? Is it heating? All of that can be put in here. So if we're happy with this, we can close it, save the mini server. And we'll have a look in a second to see how can we adjust things, what can we change, and so on. So open the app. There it is. We go to rooms, plant room. And now we have finished flow monitor that is nice and green. And it's very, very attractive. As you can see, at the moment, I don't have far too many values. So the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to start my immersion heater. And you can see immediately there's energy flowing into the immersion heater. I also want to increase the power flow. So obviously kind of wake up the grid and see that there's some power flowing through. And maybe I want to have a little bit of production from the, oh no, that's my car charger, sorry. Maybe we want to have some production virus in here. Let's go in and just uh, virtual input. Where did that go? Yeah, there we go. So we're producing 22 kilowatts. So if we go back, oh, energy flow monitor. You can see what exactly is happening, but maybe at this point is not as obvious because you can see everything is going from one direction to the other. I was just going to decrease the power of flow a bit, increase the grid, increase the values, and then everything's flowing in different directions, but Yes, so something important to mention. Obviously, we have the immersion heater, we have the car charger, which is currently not on. We have the battery, we have the grid, and there's another section that's called ADA. If you have multiple consumers, for every single consumer that you know about, that is going to be put, let's say, either in a category or we can group them up, which is exactly what I want to show you. So we're going to make a group and we're going to group the car charger and the immersion heater, for example. So we clean this one a bit. So let's go back to the energy flow monitor, double click. And now we can see, let's say, just click on here. We're going to create a new group. That group we're going to call consumers. And then we want to put the immersion heater and we want to put the car charger in consumers. So we clean it out a bit. So every single thing that is a consumer goes into that section. We close it. We save the mini server. There we go. Energy flow monitor. 
And now we can see consumers, we have the immersion heater of car charger of, so if I go and switch on the immersion heater itself, Well, I want to switch it on timer. There we go. You can see where is energy flowing. It's coming from the battery. It's coming from the PV, and it's going to all the consumers. It's going to the grid. So it's basically being redirected around the whole house. If I increase the flow, you can see how much everything's currently consuming. We can adjust values on all sides as much as you want to. So you can see PV currently producing 9.8 kilowatts, but the whole house needs about 30 something. So basically can be removed ADA. There is a way to kind of go around it. So ADA is again, that category, which just shows us every single thing that we're not monitoring. So if we have the information on how much energy the house is currently using, we can say, okay, we're using 20 kilowatts, but we only know about 10 kilowatts of consumers. So we know about a car charger, we know about the immersion heater, we know about maybe a couple of laptops and stuff like that, but there's still another 10 kilowatts that are used by something else, so maybe other. So what is a way to really get rid of that information? As you can see, that's currently 27 kilowatts. So if you go back to config, we can go around and we can look the information you can see from the grid we have this output which is oh, which is the meet and reading delivery so we can grab that delivery and we can create a different category we can create a different meter that meter for example we can call house and then we can put the house on the consumer so we can have a general category and say consumers in the house so let me grab a meter call it house and now we go meter reading and save in the mini server first of all okay and now we go back to the energy flow monitor we add a meter, we're going to add the house, apply. The house is obviously a consumer. So what we're going to do, I'm just gonna call this actually, um, the group itself, I'm gonna call house. And then maybe this instead of house, I'll just call it house. Uh, let, let's leave it as house for, for the minute. It, it doesn't matter as much and just drop it in that group as well, not under the immersion heater, under here, close, save in. We go back. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. Um, so 29.5 is the overall. So we have to actually do a little bit of calculations. But basically, we can combine, we can use a power flow, we can combine a current reading, and we can say, okay, if we have 29 kilowatts, whatever it is, or the X's, everything else that we're drawing, just have it into a block like this one, and then just resend that value somewhere else. So in our case, house is off. Why is it off? Because the power flow is not connected. So it's just me being as silly as I can. Let's grab this, connect the power flow as well. Save in the mini server. Go back. Energy flow monitor. That R category is still not adjusted, but I think you got the gist of it or the general idea. As long as we have every single consumer in, in that energy block, we can combine that information between all of them. We can output it directly into the block and we can say, okay, instead of other, half house. So for now, just Bear with me, we're going to add a couple of different features, a couple of different devices, but then I assume it is also possible to just be able to readjust other at some point. At this point of time, it's obviously not as easy as saying, okay, X amount of energy is going somewhere and then instead of other code, something else, 
but we can work around it and just basically have the house or anything else in. So besides that, do we have any questions, anything specific that you'd like to know as a use case or something that is quite confusing? Because I know all of these blocks, they are obviously replacing the utility meter. The utility meter used to be the one block that does everything, but Yes, yes. So if you can account for all the consumers, the other section is going to disappear. Um, perhaps software update at some point in the future. Yes, maybe. As everything else, it's based on demand. So if the demand shows, yes, we're going to obviously attend to that. Then did I see... What's the benefit of using a stairwell light switch in the case of an immersion heater? The uh, main use case for an immersion heater, so if I didn't answer that on time, but obviously you don't want to use the immersion heater as just an on and off. You want to make sure whenever you switch it on, even if it's for three hours, that it switches off eventually at some point, you don't just forget it running, just because it's a very, very expensive thing to run. Obviously, you don't want it to overheat as well. If you have a thermostat, that's an easy thing. The thermostat is going to switch it off itself, but overall, that's the one thing. Can we export the data? Yes, we can. How are we going to export that data? It's fairly straightforward again. You go to the mini server, you go in here to download statistics. We load the statistics from today that we have created from the blocks. And you can see hot water, immersion heater, everything in here. You can click on export. And that is going to download all the statistics to your laptop, all the statistics to obviously your local device. But also, you can send them via email, you can lock them on a syslog server on the local network, or you can send it to the mini service SD card directly. So you can also pull it from there if you want. If we go over a certain level, can we display a message on the app? Rob, do you mean a certain level, for example, we go over 20 kilowatts of usage? So if you use more than 20 kilowatts, just send a notification in the app and say, okay, more than 20 kilowatts are currently used, or we might trip a circuit, something like that. How to bring all data in. So there is not, we don't currently have an easy way to bring uh, all data in. The way is obviously come in here, you can see that data. You can pull that log file from the mini server, or you can download this file. You can add all the data to that file uh, in the same format, and then you can send that file back to the syslog server, whatever it is. So whenever it pulls it, it sees all the old entries. So that's the way we can pull data for now. It's a bit of a workaround, um, but maybe something else could come as well. I can't really speak from the developer point of view, as I don't know. They have surprised us with quite a lot of devices. So how does one, can the data be exported to Excel? We have a use case, yes, yes, yes. So it's, I don't want to go with my emails because my emails are absolutely hectic, but, okay. Basically, if you send that file over, or if I export that file, let me let me grab one of them. Ooh, 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 we have quite a few now. We've been doing some data. Wait, wait, chill for a second. Let's say I export this one to yeah this PC desktop. Say okay. Export then that is going to create a file on my desktop in kind of CSV slash Excel format. And basically I can use that file. I can open it up. I can see all the entries. So I can send an email directly with an Excel file. And then the customer or HR team can read that directly through. So where did the chat go? Then we have we will be covering how to dynamically use access 
EV to also car charges power in the future webinar. That is a very good idea. So for example, I can briefly mention this right now, but if we go to the grid or if you go to the house or the PV, you can obviously see um, the meter for today, or you can see how much power you're currently producing. And we can quite easily use the energy manager not the energy monitor, sorry guys, the energy manager, there it is. And we can say, we can plug that information to the energy manager and we can say whenever we're producing more than three kilowatts at the moment, then start outputting that information to the uh, car charger. And then the car charger, we can dynamically change based on how much we're currently producing. So basically, if we want to have a flat line, instead of having peaks where we're saving energy, we can flat make a flat out in here, but it's definitely a good idea for a webinar. And I think we should have one on energy management on its own because it's a very extensive topic again. I hope us would be scrolling through message on the screen saying you are drawing too much energy. We can quite easily do that. So for example, let's say you have some threshold for yourself. There's two ways to go about it. One is going to be the load manager. So the load manager, basically, if you have quite a few devices that are high consumers switched on at the same time, is going to switch one or the other off to make sure that we don't trip the circuit. And you can use something like this. Whenever it switches on or whenever it does something, it's going to give you some more information, available power, maximum available power. And maybe as soon as one of the devices switches off, you can send that information to the system, maybe in a, let's say, if we go to messages, in a system message, send that system message to the device and tell it, okay, the severity of the information is critical. And then the message that we're sending can be, for example, power control above 30 kilowatts. And then that information is going to be right in the customer's face and it's going to be very, very prominent and they have to say, okay, otherwise the mini service, I'm going to go back to green hard. It's going to be the red hard. It's going to be very prominent in there. So yeah, this is one way to do it. You can do notifications as well. You can send emails, everything that you can normally do. You can have in here as well. So yeah, fairly simple, straightforward. Um, anything else that you guys are thinking about? Otherwise, I do have a few things on my side. I know we're running over time. Apologies. I know it's a not that short of a topic. 